Hello watch enthusiasts and welcome to Watch Chronicler. Dive watches have become a serious interest for a lot of watch lovers and collectors due to their inherent practicality and the feeling of adventure which they provide us with. Of course, this hint of adventure can come from their extensive use by most military forces, their appearance in popular culture and films, or most obviously, their use in the world of diving, potentially the most extreme environment most of us can actually access. Because of course space is, after all, out of bounds for the time being for the vast majority of people. But the dive watch is no new product, and has existed since, in some forms, albeit not modern ones, the 1930s. So as we enter a new decade, it seems only right to decide which watch from each past decade truly deserves to be seen as the dive watch of that decade. Of course such a decision is always going to be down to opinion, and I'm not prone to shying away from such a challenge of classification, so today I'd like to address this matter in light of viewers' enjoyment of my previous series about interesting watches from each past decade. But before we begin, a bit of housekeeping. If you enjoy this video, please consider subscribing here on YouTube to always catch the latest pieces, which will always strive to be as complete, informative, and as interesting as they possibly can be. Also, remember to follow Watch Chronicler on Instagram to catch notification of any new watches, videos, or podcasts long before they appear. And finally, I'd like to announce that Watch Chronicler will be partnering with Aquastar for some sponsored content. Of course, this may not come as a surprise, as after paying to buy, own, and wear the new Deep Star from Aquastar, I've essentially only good things to say about its quality and design, and I really do only have good things to say about the brand behind it, and their vision to bring back this incredibly important watch, and one which does actually come up later in the video. So here's a little bit about that watch. If you're enjoying this video, I suspect that dive watches and the history of subaquatic exploration will be of interest, including the work of Jacques Cousteau. Following his joint invention of the Aqualung in 1943 with Émile Gagnon, Cousteau's influence on many of our imaginations came with episodes of The Undersea World of Jacques Cousteau, appearing from 1966 to 76 in its first run. What few may know, however, is that the watch seen in the first episode of this hugely influential series was the Aquastar Deep Star, perhaps the most important diving chronograph of all time, usable down to 100 metres, and with the provision to calculate necessary decompression for consecutive dives. Nevertheless, by the 21st century, the brand had all but disappeared from the diving scene. However, in 2020, under the new ownership of the Synchron Group, the company that brought back icons like the Doxa Sub in the early 2000s, Aquadive and also the Isofrain and Tropic Straps, Aquastar is back with the brand new Deep Star, with modern specifications and classical looks. Watch our review to find out more, or head over to aquastar.ch to get your own piece of dive watch history. Before addressing each dive watch of the decade, I think it's very important to think about where water-resistant watches came from to really understand the context and importance of each of those pieces. In 1926, as most of you will probably already know, Rolex launched their Oyster Case, an exceptional choice of name for a clever and water-resistant watch. However, it was far from the first dive watch for two key reasons. It wasn't the first waterproof watch by any means, and also wasn't conceived to resist water pressure. Since the 1850s, screwed crowns and water-resistant cases had existed, and been used to impress at such events as the 1851 Great Exhibition in London. Similarly, some waterproof wristwatches also existed, but it was Rolex which truly standardised, commercialised and publicised such an achievement. But if the Oyster was no dive watch on account of resisting water, but not depth, the first dive watch to appear was the Omega Marine in 1932. The Omega Marine, however, was hardly a fully developed diver. Conceived in the same square format as the contemporary Gégé Le Coutre Reverso, released the year prior, the Marine used its square shape to seal the crown, movement dial and inner crystal within an external locking case. Aesthetically, it was a much simpler and more traditional offering than, for instance, the Panerai dive watches, which also appeared that very decade, but it also demonstrated the key principle behind a dive watch, resistance to water at depth. The Marine demonstrated this in Lake Geneva in 1936, when kept at 73 metres for 30 minutes, and again in a laboratory in 1937, when a simulated depth of 135 metres was reached with no issues. Notably, William Beebe, the naturalist famous for his dives to almost a thousand metres off the coast of Bermuda in the bathysphere to observe deep sea animals, wore a marine both in the submersible and whilst diving, and Amelia Earhart, the famous aviation pioneer, also selected the marine as her watch of choice. But the marine, and indeed the Panerai watches produced in the 1930s and 1940s, were not what we would today understand as dive watches in terms of the format they used. For that reason, I'd like to begin our story in the 1950s. Whilst the 1930s and 1940s were a period of experimentation for the dive watch, 
It was in the 50s that the format was truly perfected as we would understand it today. That is, the combination of durability, legibility, and a method of timing impervious to water damage, in effect a rotating bezel. Now I've spoken about the history of dive watches before, and I won't go over it again, but it is important to pick out a few of the really important dive watches from this decade before deciding upon the most important. Produced from 1953 onwards, the first dive watch was most likely the Blancpain 50 Fathoms, as specified by Lieutenant Claude Riffaut and Bob Meloubier, who together searched for a watch which would furnish their new covert diving corps for the French Navy. However, the very same year, Zodiac released their Seawolf for the recreational diver, which suggests that the 50 Fathoms was perhaps not as innovative as was first assumed. Ultimately, though, I don't think either deserved the title, because neither had a serious, long-lasting and perpetual impact on the way we see dive watches. Another option could be the Omega CK2913, the first Seamaster 300, and an undeniably impressive piece of kit in 1957. Fitted with Omega's legendary 550 generation automatic calibre, it was a stunningly well-made piece and pioneered technology such as the Naiad Crown, named after the mythical Greek water nymphs, which tightened underwater pressure. However, the early Seamaster didn't see an immense amount of use, and courtesy of its innovative crown leaking at shallow depth, it must give way for what must be the most important dive watch of the decade. Launched in 1954, but circulated as a prototype in 1953, the original Rolex Submariner reference 6204 was a very simple watch, and true to Rolex form, absolutely only what was necessary. It was composed of luminous hands, a rotating aluminium bezel, without the danger of cracking, as was seen on other bezel solutions, it must be added, a black dial and a screwed crown, it really was the whole package as we would understand it today. Almost immediately after this, a more definitive recipe arrived with the counterintuitively numbered reference 6200, which pushed water resistance up to 200 metres, just where it would remain for the next few decades. In reality, if one thinks about it, it's far more of an ancestor to the modern dive watch than the ever-changing format of the Blancpain 50 Fathoms, and unlike the Seamaster 300, worked immediately. If you wanted the ultimate 1950s Submariner, it would probably be the reference 6538, which, aside from being famous for its James Bond connection in the 60s, refined the 200 meter 50s no crown guard Submariner with Mercedes hands, a larger crown, and of course the red triangle at 12. Whilst the 1950s were the opportunity for the dive watch to become what it is today, it was the 1960s which refined the concept in plenty of different ways. Critically, there are two matters which, to me, refine the search for the dive watch of the decade considerably. Firstly, this was a time when, for a professional diver, visiting the bottom of the sea was almost always a temporary excursion, as experiments to stay there such as Conshelf and Sea Lab remained both primitive, dangerous, and critically experimental rather than functional dives. Secondly, the dive computer remained two decades away, and so the ultimate dive watch was one which allowed the easiest calculation of decompression times. In this regard, two pieces stand above the others, even if there were some phenomenal watches from other brands, like the second generation Seamaster 300, which really was a masterpiece, but didn't have the long-lasting impact on what took place that decade to really warrant the title. There is, of course, the Doxa Sub 300, which was released in 1967, although some examples seem to have dated back to 1965. This now iconic tunnel-shaped watch changed the aesthetics of the time and encouraged the large, brightly coloured hands of the 1970s. Nevertheless, its bezel only reliably indicated no decompression times for the first dive of the day, hardly a likely workload for a professional dive watch. That's why the watch I believe to fit the 1960s is the very sponsor of this video, the Aquastar Deepstar. And yes, that's why I chose to place that Aquastar mention in this particular video, not the other way around. This watch didn't have the water resistance of the Sub-300, Submariner or Seamaster of the time, but then again so few divers ventured beyond 100 metres it didn't really matter, especially given that most didn't have the additional holes drilled in their cases. What did matter was that this diving chronograph displayed bezel graduations suitable to calculate decompression for multiple consecutive dives, whilst its chronograph display and running indicator in the form of a white lozenge made it a really pure tool. Of course, the Deep Star also had its drawbacks, including a manual Virgil 23 or 72 movement, requiring the opening and closing of the crown on a regular basis, but then, when an automatic alternative hadn't yet been invented, one can't be too punitive. Altogether, the Deep Star best answered the timing needs of the period, and even when the bezel was being used to calculate weights between dives, the chronograph remained operational. All of these reasons give some suggestion as to why it was used for so many years after its launch in 1965. The ultimate version of the Deep Star, and something which I'd love to see return to the Aquastar range, even in a small limited edition, 
was the version which came with a large plate mounted to the diver's arm. This added a depth gauge, water thermometer, and compass to the Deep Star's arsenal of functions. When the 1970s arrived, professional diving was entering a very new period of industrial saturation work in enclosed, pressurised habitats. In these, rotating bezels or chronographs were no longer the be-all and end-all of diving, and instead resistance to the changing pressure levels inside and outside a diving bell became more important. Omega and Seiko, with their Ploprof and Tuna models, circumvented the issue of exploding watches when the pressure inside the bell was reduced by sealing their watches entirely. In principle, this was a demonstration of truly staggering engineering, especially since their watches would never be able to equalise and therefore would bear the weight of the sea for their entire time under pressure. However, the reality was that you needed to unscrew the crown anyway in order to reset the time underwater, something totally impossible with such a large pressure difference. In practice, therefore, the pressurised gas breathed by divers inside their chambers had to enter the watch at some point, whether they liked it or not. Of course, some of you will already have thought of the idea of simply unscrewing the crown to increase the pressure and unscrewing it again when the pressure is reduced, but the reality was that there were complications to that, including moisture entering the watch if left for long periods of time with the crown open. And this is perhaps why Rolex's approach in developing the Sea Dweller reference 1665 in the late 1960s and releasing it in the early 70s made real sense. Here was all the reliability and familiarity of a submariner, but with a thicker case and an effortless resistance to the elements, courtesy of a helium escape valve. Much did nevertheless change to make the Sea Dweller, and it would be foolish to ignore such adjustments. Notably, the crystal and case grew much thicker and more resilient, whilst the Cyclops lens was removed due to these very changes. Still, the fact that Rolex had to reclassify the water resistance as 610 meters from the original 500 showed the toughness of the package. Amusingly, the helium escape valve used by these early watches, being tested very seriously by their environment, was a remarkably crude device controlled by a leaf spring, a system far removed from the multi-piece coil spring operated second generation system we have today. Nevertheless, it worked, which was the main thing, and one has to remember that, even if it wasn't such a technological leap as the other watches mentioned, it was expensive enough to produce to warrant submariners with helium escape valves fitted to be used for dives which didn't need the Sea Dweller's sheer resistance to depth. Ultimately, I wish I could make either the Ploprof or Tuna the dive watch of the decade, however the Sea Dweller, a staple of most divers' wrists courtesy of Comex's partnership with the brand in the early 70s, did on balance contribute far more to diving, even if it wasn't nearly as innovative as the other two. The 1980s are not remembered as a gleaming period for the watch. This was a time when, with the seemingly limitless advance of quartz timekeeping, Switzerland was struggling to find its identity in the industry. Of course, we know that this changed, yet for the dive watch, the result was longer lasting. Already in the late 1970s, Seiko had added a high-grade quartz movement to their tuna saturation diver, itself a seriously impressive bit of kit, in the aim of achieving increased durability, reliability and accuracy. However, it isn't a Seiko product which I intend to speak of, but rather a piece from Citizen, which in its own way was the predecessor of the watch most used amongst real divers today, the Casio G-Shock. The Casio G-Shock, in Frogman configuration available from the early 1990s, is more of a tool than a watch, and after the launch of dive computers in the 1980s, a watch needed to become a tool once more. This is why I believe the Citizen Aqualand may be seen as the dive watch of the 1980s. Launched in 1986, the original Aqualand Promaster replaced the depth gauge watches of old with either mechanical or electromechanical systems which were never found to be particularly accurate. Instead, this was a purely modern watch with a quartz movement which delivered timing capabilities, a depth gauge, the rate of ascent and even alarms for accurate and safe diving. In most ways, if you take into account the re-engineered case, calendar and movement to arrive in 1992, the Aqualand Promaster epitomised the 1980s and their technical contribution to diving, even if with black and gold variants available, it also kept the stylistic heritage of the period. Sure, the Aqualand Promaster is no horological wonder, but as a tool for diving, it's difficult to imagine something more suitable for the period, and also more important as a fantastic all-rounder, which you can see on the wrists of a vast number of divers even today. The final decade which I'd like to look at is the 1990s, a time when the gold tone excess of the 1980s gave way to strong curves, and much to the surprise of anyone in the 1980s, mechanical movements. In this world, the Aqualand was still a superb tool, but no longer a desirable watch. In the 1990s, I would argue for the greatness of two dive watches. The first was the Omega Seamaster 300M. This was a watch which, by being a more affordable, more approachable and less old-school luxury watch than a Rolex Submariner, 
gained serious appeal amongst both civilians and military personnel. Through this, the Seamaster 300M relaunched the concept of a luxury dive watch. Even more important, however, was the second watch, the Seiko SKX. Launched in 1996, the SKX was in essence a revision of the 7002 Seiko dive watch released back in 1988. That watch took the 150m entry-level Seiko dive watch and added to it a slimmer case, more refined looks, and in its final years, a 200m resistance by the early 90s. This heritage was picked up by the SKX, which put together all the attributes of a phenomenal dive watch for most people. With a widely manageable 42mm case, or 37mm, in the case of mid-size variants like the SKX-013, very reliable if agricultural 7S26 movement, screw-down crown and rotating bezel, it was all the dive watch anyone needed. It was also a watch with some impressive features like the 120-click bezel, as well as the very clever magic lever automatic winding, which meant the Seiko could do away with manual winding from the crown, and even forgot about hacking of the seconds, because ultimately neither were particularly important to most people who would use this on a daily basis or for diving. Thanks to its affordable price and relatively high build quality, albeit with somewhat mediocre finishing by modern Seiko standards, the SKX could be treated as a tool in a time when most other mechanical dive watches were too expensive to be really knocked around and not worried about at all. The final contribution of this model was its power to bring people into the dive watch camp by providing a distilled, easily understood definition of what a mechanical tool watch could do. It may not have been the most handsome, innovative or forward-looking, but it was undeniably important. But what do you think of my choices? Do you think I chose correctly, or do you think I've really missed out on a fantastic piece for one of these decades? Please let me know in the comment section below. Certainly it's probably impossible to boil down a decade of diving history to one watch, yet the exercise does focus the mind on exactly what the priorities of each period were. Thank you very much for watching, this is Armon from watchchronicle.com, out.